I've uh, mentioned a number of times before from this podium or pulpit that, uh, that knowing God is everything. And you may be tired of hearing that, uh, but uh, truly as I reflect over this short series that we've been going through, I come again to the conclusion that uh, there's no running away from the fact that knowing God would uh, hold you in good stead uh, in the journey that your life will take you to in the years ahead of you. Because as many preachers have said, and I think they are right in saying that it is only a matter of time uh, before the sky falls on you. Uh, really, it's only a matter of time. And when that does happen, then how you stand will very much depend on who you know your God to be. So, as I've said before, that I don't like to do theodicy in the hospital ward because by then... Uh, yeah, it's a trifle too late because that's the time I want to serve communion to the families around the bed. Uh, that's the time when I want to pray and sing together. And the time to do the Odyssey is now, really. So, I, so today is just another little step on that journey of knowing God. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for life, that our hearts beat, that our lungs are pulling air. This is another day of gift, another day of life, another day where salvation draws near. So be merciful to us, Lord. We are helpless without you. We are penniless without you. We suffer deep poverty without you. It is only in you, through you, that we have life. So be merciful, Father. Shower us with life. Shower us with your words of life, we pray. Teach us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to what is easily the most unpopular attributes of all the attributes of God. Christians generally shy away from talking about the wrath of God. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, he says the subject of divine wrath has become taboo in our modern society. And Christians, by and large, have accepted the taboo and conditioned themselves never to raise the matter. C.H. Dodds, one-time professor of divinity at Cambridge, held the view that the wrath of God is an archaic, outdated idea. But why do so many Christians shy away from affirming God's wrath? <clears throat> many do so because they equate the emotion of anger with moral failure. But that's because we think of God's wrath as God going on a fit of rage, losing his cool, blowing his lid off, ranting and raving and flying off the handle. And they conclude that surely it is not God to be acting like that. Uh, it puts him in a very bad light, doesn't it? And so it makes him out to be intolerant, it makes him out to be judgmental. And there are people who think that of God to be like those pagan deities, who are capricious and vindictive and uh, dishing out punishment willy-nilly as and when he wishes, a deity who could only be appeased by the offering of a bribe. But that's not God's wrath, really, as we understand it in the Word of God. God's wrath is not an erratic, temperamental, impulsive passion. God is not a curmudgeon. His wrath is not an impulsive outburst of temper. Leon Morris, the Australian theologian, says God's wrath denotes not so much 
a sudden flare of passion, which is soon over, so much so as a strong and settled opposition to all that is evil, arising from God's very nature. And John Murray says, wrath is the holy revulsion of God's being against all that is contradicting to His holiness. So God's wrath is a settled expression of His absolute displeasure of everything that is unholy, evil, and unrighteous. So God's wrath is, is His righteous, holy displeasure against sin. It is an expression of vengeance against all that is unholy. It is His holy act of retributive justice towards sinner whose actions actually demand an eternal condemnation. You see, the Bible insists that a day of wrath is coming, if not this evening, tomorrow, or thereafter, but it is coming. Isaiah says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger. Nahum says in the passage read for us by Monique, The Lord is jealous and avenging, the Lord is wrathful, and He keeps wrath for His enemies. And Jeremiah refers to the day of Jacob's trouble, a day that is coming, coming wrath of God. And Isaiah calls it the destruction of the Almighty. Ezekiel calls it a time of doom. Joel refers it to the day of, that is great and very terrible. And Amos describes the day of darkness and not light. And Zephaniah simply calls it a day of wrath. And Ezekiel's, neither their gold nor their silver shall be able to deliver them from the day of the wrath of the Lord. It is coming. It is coming. And the Bible insists that the day is coming when God's wrath will pour on us. Now, some people have argued that, oh, all this is just Old Testament stuff. <laughs> that God was then more primitive, that He hadn't yet come of age, He hadn't reached puberty, but by the time we come to the New Testament, He has mellowed, and he, He's now become a loving and merciful God. This is absolutely not true. Take it from Leon Morris. I'll take it from, take it from Packer. Packer says, anyone who reads the New Testament, and this is not the old this is the new. Anyone who reads the New Testament, says Becker, even in a most cursory way, will find at once that the Old Testament emphasis on God as wrathful, far from being reduced, is in fact intensified in the New Testament. Becker says, in fact, the New Testament is overshadowed by the certainty of a coming day of wrath. Take it from our Lord Himself. Our Lord Himself speaks of the day of wrath. He calls it a time of great tribulation. This is from the mouth of Jesus Christ Himself. And John, John makes a sharp contrast between salvation in Christ and God's wrath. He says, he who has the Son has life. But he who has not the Son of God has no life but the wrath of God falls on him. That's John. Now take it from Paul. Paul warns us against sexual immorality and impurity and lust and greed. And he says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. He calls it a day of wrath. <laughs> In a most unflattering way, Paul says, we are all by nature children of wrath. And the writer to the book of Hebrews plainly says, our God is a consuming fire. But by the time you reach the book of Revelation, it gets literally gruesome, brutally explicit. Listen to this. John says on the island of Patmos, he says, on that day the Lord himself with his breath, like a river of burning pitch, like a stream of burning sulfur, will stoke with hot burning wood, and start the fire. This is Jesus himself starting that fire. And he says they will drink of the wine of God's wrath poured 
unmixed into the cup of his anger, and they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb of God. And he says, on that day, the seven angels would be given the seven vials full of the wrath of God. And people will call on rocks and mountains, fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come. Who is able to stand? You know, people will be so frightened, they will fall over dead. They will cry out and yell out for mercy. And Jesus, predicting the fall of Jerusalem just before his return, he says how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress on that land, and wrath shall fall upon his people. Now, does all this sound like a gentle tap to your wrist? Does this sound like a gentle slap to your wrist? And yet all this is found not in the Old Testament, but in the New. Now, there are three basic things for which God will pour out His wrath. Now, it's all taken from one single verse in Romans 1, 18. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against one, ungodliness, two, unrighteousness, and three, the suppression of truth. Now, you proceed three just proceed three verses forward to verse 21. It is crystallized all there for you. For although they knew God, although they knew God, they honor Him not, neither give thanks to Him. They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts are darkened. Now that is the sin under all sins for which the wrath of God will come. And what's that? They glorified him not. Lucifer did that. Adam did that. Heaps of people today are doing that. They know God's truth, Romans 1.19. What may be known about God is plain to them. Two, they suppress God's truth, Romans 1.18. They suppress the truth of God by their wickedness. And three, this ungodliness and unrighteousness invites God's wrath. Colossians 3, 6, on account of this, the wrath of God is coming. Romans 2, 5 makes this abundantly clear. Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, while we may speak of the coming wrath of God, there is a sense in which wrath has already fallen on your head and my head, even now as we gather in this room. The fact that every man, woman, and child is vulnerable to death is evidence that we now live in the shadow of the wrath of God. Death is God's judgment on sin. Romans 5, 15, by the transgression of one man, we all die. Adam actually heard it directly from the lips of God himself. In the day that you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. The very fact that man, woman, and child die is evidence that we live under the shadow of His wrath. And further, we trace God's wrath in a sense of futility and misery that we see all around us. Charles Hodge refers to the misery that is caused by moral evil as the present manifestation of God's wrath. The erosion of civility, the brazen depravity we see all around us, the blatant indecency, the degradation of purity and virtue, all these are evidences of God's wrath that has fallen on us now at work. We have rejected God, and in turn, God judicially abandons us and gives us over to evil. 
It's the reason why you and I live under the veil of tears. There is not a day that passes without someone coming to grief in some areas of life. Illness, toil of labor, relationship fractures, loneliness, depression, anxiety, worry, aging. These are evidences that we live under His wrath. You know, nature too is not spared. Among animals, we see merciless, savage, brutal killing. Tennyson says it very well. Tennyson says, we see nature red in tooth and claw. Romans 8.20, creation is subjected to futility, condemned to frustration. So the whole world stands under the wrath of God. And you and I, we stand in need of redemption. But let me tease you out a little at this point. I wonder what your answer would be if I should ask you, what is God saving us from? What is God saving you from? You would probably say, God is saving me from sin. And you're not wrong. But you're not spot on. If I should press you a little more and tell you that there is something more horrendous that He's saving you from, you might say He's saving me from hell. And again, you're right. But again, you need to go deeper. But what if I should rephrase the question and ask you, from who is God saving you? From who is God saving you? And you might say, from Satan, from the world, from the flesh. Again and again, you're right, but not quite there. Strange as it may sound, the one we've got to be saved from is God. He's coming at you. Romans 5, 9, Since we now have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God? You see, the Orthodox Jewish Bible translates John the Baptist's words this way, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the Sharon of Hashem Haba, that is from the coming wrath of, of, of Hashem, the coming wrath of God Himself, not the devil because the devil himself will be punished. The wrath comes from the hand of God. God is the one from whom we must be saved. It is God who is coming at us with his wrath to destroy us for the sin that is in our hearts. Listen to Amos. Seek the Lord and live, lest he breaks out on fire, devouring you completely. Let's push this a little further. You might be surprised to find out at the end of the ages who it is that will be the one who executes God's judgment upon our necks, upon our heads. It will not be Satan, because Satan himself will be punished. The one who will execute God's wrath on you or on unbelievers will be none other than the meek and mild and gentle Lamb of God. He it is who will be wielding the sword on that great day of judgment. He may be humble. He may be self-abased. He may have submitted himself to the abuse and humiliation of wicked people at his first coming, but at the second coming, he will be the one who will will the sword of God's wrath. John describes Jesus as both judge and executioner. He says, and from his mouth, that is the mouth of Jesus, okay? And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron and treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. It is God, the Lord God, Son of God Himself, who will execute God's wrath. The cup of iniquity is full. 
The angel with his sickle is ready. The grapes of wrath are ripe. They are gathered and thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God and trodden outside the city wall. All right, let me make a shift of gear here. Let me ask the big question, and it is this. Why is God this angry? I mean, isn't all this an overkill? It sounds like trying to light a cigarette with a torch burner. You know? What could humans have done to warrant such horrendous judgment? What rattles people's cage is the thought that God could be this judgmental, this merciless, this wrathful. So how may we understand God's wrathfulness? Let me put it this way. Most of you, I believe, do have a sense of outrage. Most of you experience a sense of outrage when you hear of little babies killed in their mother's womb by suction machines and forceps, or when you hear of abuse and rape and murder and other forms of social injustice, you get outraged within you. A person who has his little sister molested will not respond with some kind of a benign tolerance. No, far from it. He will be enraged. He will go on a rampage. The more he loves his little sister, the more fiery will be his hatred for the perpetrator. Now, our disregard of God, our distrust of Him, our unbelief, our ingratitude, our indifference, Indeed, our defiance of Him is an infinitely greater sin than all sins put together. John MacArthur rightly says that a crime is wicked in proportion to the worth of the one assaulted. There are no penalties for smashing a mosquito. If you kill a dog, you get into more trouble. If you, keep, if you kill a rare Siberian snow leopard, you get into more trouble. But if you kill a human person, your guilt increases because a person is of greater worth than an animal. But when you assault the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God, you offend the infinitely greatest, most exalted being. And an offense against an infinitely holy being will demand an infinity of judgment and condemnation and penalty. So when you look at this, when you look at it this way, God's wrath is not an overkill. It is a just and proportionate judgment on sin against an infinitely holy, majestic, righteous God. God's wrath is an expression of his righteous revulsion of all that violates and defiles his holiness. It is his holy act of retributive justice towards sinners whose actions deserve an eternity of condemnation. In fact, God's wrath reveals the infinite worth of His holiness. He wouldn't be that wrathful if He isn't that holy. Didn't Habakkuk say, you are of purer eyes than to be, look at evil. God pours out His wrath to vindicate His holiness. Hell is intensely furious because God is zealously holy. Hell is unbearably tormenting because God is outrageously holy. Hell is so long because God's holiness is infinitely precious. I've mentioned so many times from this pulpit before that if God is incapable of wrath, He wouldn't be holy. He won't be righteous. A God who is incapable, or a God who is incapable of, of an infinite hatred against sin would be a God who is morally deficient. What kind of a God would he be if, if he looked at chastity and depravity with equal gratification? If he cannot hate what is profane and vile and defile, he cannot love what is pure and virtuous. 
Now let me push this a little closer to home. Let me ask if God's wrath is this horrendous. Then, until you come to God, you are in a most vulnerable place. Jonathan Edwards describes unrepentant sinners as people walking over the pit of hell, walking on timber flooring, so rotten and slippery, it's only a matter of time before they fall through. And the only reason they haven't fallen is because they are preserved by God's restraining grace. And then he quotes from Deuteronomy, in due time, their foot will slip. Edward says that because of their sins, they have become heavy as lead, always tending downwards, heavy as lead. And if God should let them go, they would plunge into hell. And all that they thought will save them, their wealth, their health, their wisdom, would not able to keep them away from hell any more than a spider's web could stop a falling rock. This is red graphic. Edwards. Where then do you stand? What hope do you have? What hope do I have? That's where our text comes in that Monique read out to us from Matthew 26. Our text tells us that when our Lord was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, He said, My soul is very sorrowful to the point of death. Luke tells us that his distress was so intense, he sweat drops of blood. Now we need to get as close to the bottom as we possibly can as to why our Lord is in such agony. What exactly is it that he so dreaded that he shuddered? We get a hint of this from what he feared. And we get a hint of what he feared from the line in his prayer. He says, Father, if it be at all possible, please, please remove this cup away from me. Now, just what is in that cup that's causing him to stagger? J.D. Greer gets us to see how puzzling this whole prayer is, really. That Jesus, remember? No one else is praying this prayer but Jesus. That Jesus, the eternal Word of God, the one who spoke worlds and planets into existence, the one who quelled the fiercest storm, who cast out demons, who healed diseases, who brought the dead back to life, should be so horrified at what he saw that he came to the point of physically dying. Just what was it that he saw? That's the question we ask. What exactly did he see? But Greer gets us to say, Greer gets to see it this way. Greer says the real question is what did he not see that caused him to shudder? What did he not see that caused him to shake, that caused him to come to the point of death? He did not see the Father reaching out to him. That's what he did not see. He did not see the Father comforting him he called on the Father to have the cup removed and his prayer was met with a stony silence. Not once, if you had listened to Monique read carefully, his prayer was met with a stony silence three times. Now can you imagine the Son and the Father have had this intimate relationship for all eternity. I didn't plan to say this, but I'll say it anyway. I see Gloria walking into the kitchen door many times a day. I still see her walking through the kitchen door. That's how I miss my dear wife. But we were only together for 47 years. Now take this point here. Imagine the Son and the Father had been intimate for all eternity. And that's an awful long time. And then for the very first time, 
ever since the span of all eternity, the father snubs, snubs the son, shuns the son, treats him with disdain. So what did he do? He ran to his disciples for comfort. Now this is in the stealth of night. He ran to his disciples for comfort. Where were they? Sleeping. So he ran back to the spot where he was praying and again for the second time he cried out, please, please, Papa, please, Papa, take this cup away from me. Again, stony silence. Runs back another time to his disciples and they were deep in sleep. Runs back to the Father and asks for one last time. He was met with stony silence. Deafening silence. Greer tells us, now listen to this, this is crucial. Greer tells us that William Lane, the New Testament scholar, makes the point that right here in the Garden of Gethsemane, God had already begun to turn his face away. The judgment for sin has already begun even before the first nail was nailed into his palm. I've never seen it that way before. They're right back at the garden. The abandonment had begun. Jesus' soul was being abandoned by God. This silence from the Father is a fulfillment of Psalm 22.1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Is it any wonder why that garden was called Gethsemane? It's a beautiful word, but it has a horrendous meaning. It means wine press. Jesus had already begun being put on the wine press, and the pressure of the vice has already turned. You know how you trodden on the grapes to get wine? Gethsemane is the wine press, and the one being pressed is our Lord Himself. And this is why He fought off the cup, because the cup is a metaphor of God's wrath. The cup that Jesus sought to have removed is the pure, undiluted, full bodied portion of divine wrath. So God handed Him the, wrath, the cup. The question is, did Jesus drink from the cup? We know that he did because at the ninth hour on the cross, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lamas baktani. Now, few people understand Aramaic on that spot, on the hill in Golgotha. Very few understand Aramaic. But there was no mistaking that it was a haunting, ghastly cry. And someone said this, that for the first time, human people on earth heard a cry that rose from the bottom of Gehenna. What seems to be happening here? Martin Luther once sat motionless for hours, as if in a trance, denying himself of food and drink. He remained absorbed in deep contemplation. Finally, he stood up and exclaimed, God forsaken by God, who can understand? You see, describing the cry of dereliction, by the way, this is called the cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Describing the cry of dereliction, Calvin rightly says that that is the best commentary to the line in the creed that says he descended into hell. And John Duncan divinity professor of Edinburgh in Scotland who died in 1870 once asked this question, do you know what it was to be forsaken by the Father? It was damnation. In the language of the car park, damn you. The Father damned the Son. But isn't that the essence of what hell is? Complete abandonment by the Father. When Jesus hung there on the cross, our sins were lump upon Him, imputed to Him. The vindictive wrath of God was poured upon Him. 
the sword of justice was sheathed into him, and he bore the brunt of the Father's wrath, the curse of God's wrath that should rightly fall on you and me fell on him. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we may have the righteousness of the Father. St. Corinthians 5.21 God shielded you and me from his wrath by pouring it out into the cup of his own son and Jesus satisfied God's justice, propitiated God's wrath. Joel Beakey says, God's elect now have full immunity. God's elect now have full immunity from God's wrath. My question is right now, as you sit there listening to you, to me, are you immune? Do you have immunity from God's wrath? We are immune, one, from God's condemnation, and we are immune, two, from God's anathema, His curse. One, we are immune from his condemnation. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1, you have got to have that in your heart. Two, we are immune from anathema, from the curse. Galatians 3.13, and that is, Christ redeemed us from the curse by himself becoming a curse for us. So Jesus' suffering satisfied the demands of God's justice, ransomed penitent sinners from his wrath, and made redemption available. Because sin against an infinite God warrants an infinite penalty. You could never finish that payment. Neither could I. But now you and I have been saved because the infinitely holy Son of God paid the infinite price so that the infinite justice of an infinitely holy God might be infinitely satisfied. Let me close by saying this, and I mean it. I pray that there is not one single soul under this roof here this morning who hasn't yet fled, fled from the wrath of God to come. If you're not a Christian, you're walking on slippery ground. And one of these days, your feet will slip. Edwards ended his famous sermon saying, Let everyone who does not now know Christ awake and fly from the wrath to come. Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Fly, run for your lives. Do not look back. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Let us pray. Our Father, we understand a little of why you are this wrathful. We understand a little why it is not an overkill. It is a just retributive judgment on those who defy you. Father, forgive us. We've all defied you. We've all turned our back on you and spit on you. But in spite of all that, you gave your son. You chose us. You elected us. You made us your own. That we might be shielded and saved from your wrath to come. Father, what have we done that we deserve this? Nothing. Undeservedly, you've saved us. And we are grateful, deeply grateful. So help us, Father, to go out from here, not to live for ourselves, but to live for your gospel, to share this dreadful news with the dreadful news, the first part of it is dreadful, but the gospel is great news. So help us to share this with those who are plunging and plummeting into hell, that they may be saved. Grant us a sense of mission of your kingdom, we ask. 
We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We want to tell you we love you, Lord. We love you. Amen.